In the previous several lectures, we discussed the details of the three stages of glycolysis. So now let's actually put all that information together into a single lecture to actually try to make sense of things. And let's summarize our results. So glycolysis is the breakdown of glucose into pyruvate molecules, ATP molecules, and NADH molecules. And all this takes place in the cytoplasm of the cell. Now, we typically break down glycolysis into three stages. We have stage one that consists of three steps. We have stage two that consists of two steps. And we have the most complex stage, stage three, uh, that consists of five steps. Now, the reason we break down glycolysis into these three stages is because each one of these stages actually carries out its own specific purpose. It has its own specific purpose. It carries out a specific function. So let's begin with stage one. In stage one, the entire point of stage one is to take that glucose molecule, trap that glucose molecule inside the cell so that it can't actually leave that cell, and begin preparing that glucose molecule for cleavage, which takes place in stage two. So the entire point of stage one is to prepare that molecule for stage two, where it basically is cleaved into two identical three carbon molecules. And once it is cleaved in stage two, it's the third stage where we harvest some of that energy, we capture some of that energy to form ATP molecules, as we'll see in just a moment. So as we discuss, each one of these individual processes, keep that in mind, because ultimately, for instance, in stage one, each one of these reactions takes place and each one of these reactions essentially wants to accomplish that end goal. So each one of these reactions in stage one wants to, wants to trap that molecule in the cell and wants to destabilize the molecule, make it more reactive so that eventually it is prepared for stage two to break down into smaller molecules. So Let's begin with stage one, process one, step one. So our glucose makes its way into the cytoplasm of the cell. What happens is an enzyme known as hexokinase, hexo means we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in our sugar. Kinase means we're going to phosphorylate that glucose. So a, a phosphoryl group is taken from the ATP by the hexokinase and is added onto carbon number six. And so we form glucose 6-phosphate. We break down the ATP into ADP and also the H ion is released as well. And this reaction releases this amount of energy. So it's an exergonic reaction. That's because the ATP is broken down into a more stable molecule and that drives this exergonic reaction. Now, the point of this step is to one, destabilize the glucose to make it more reactive and begin preparing it for stage two. And the second point is by adding this polar component, we trap that glucose in a cell. It will not be able to exit that cell because one, it can't pass the membrane and B, it cannot use any of those transport membrane proteins because its structure is different. Now let's move on to step two. In step two, the goal is to basically take that glucose 6-phosphate and transform it into an isomer, into fructose 6-phosphate. Why? Well, because in stage two, we basically want to produce two identical three carbon molecules. And to produce those two identical three carbon molecules, we have to have symmetry in our molecule. So this is not symmetric, but this is symmetric. And so the glucose 6-phosphate is transformed into fructose 6-phosphate to make sure we get those two identical three carbon molecules in stage two. So you might ask, well, if I keep this molecule in the glucose 6-phosphate stage, what will happen in stage two? Well, if we keep it in the glucose, then in stage two, we're going to form one molecule that has two carbons and one molecule that has four carbons, and that is not symmetric. So that's why we carry out step two. Again, the entire goal in stage one is to prepare that glucose for cleavage, which happens in stage two. And the enzyme that catalyzes this 
Well, this is an isomerization reaction. We transform one isomer into another, and this molecule is a glucose that contains a phosphate, and so phosphoglucose isomerase, so makes sense. And again, just like this one, this is an exergonic reaction. It takes place spontaneously under physiological conditions. Let's look at step three. So the point of step three is to continue destabilizing that molecule. So in step one, we destabilized it, increased, it energy, increased its energy and made it more reactive because we made it more polar, we added a charge, and here we add a second charge. And that makes it even more reactive and more likely to actually undergo cleavage in stage two. So we take the fructose 6-phosphate, and again, because we want to add up this foil group, what type of enzyme are we going to have? Well, a kinase. What type of kinase? Well, what type of molecule is this? It's a fructose that contains a phosphate. So phosphofructose kinase phosphorylates this process and adds that phosphoryl group onto this oxygen. And now we have a symmetrical molecule. And once the cleavage takes place in stage two, that will ultimately allow us to produce two, three carbon molecules. And notice this stage one, because we're essentially investing to prepare that molecule for cleavage, we actually use energy molecules. We use one, two ATP molecules in stage one. That's why we call this the investment stage. Now stage two, we call the cleavage state because this is where we break down this molecule that we form in stage one. So we take the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and under the guidance of an enzyme called aldolase. Why aldolase? Well, because this is an aldol reaction. And in fact, going backwards is an aldol condensation. And so that's why we call this an aldolase. So essentially what the aldolase does is it cleaves the bond here and it forms these two three carbon molecules. So again, the entire point of this step was to basically create the isomer so that once this process takes place, we produce two, three carbon molecules and not a two carbon and a four carbon molecule. So we have two, three carbon molecules. One of them is DHAP, which stands for dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And the other one is GAP, which stands for glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Now, this molecule is the one that will go on to stage three. So once we form this gap, it doesn't do anything else. But the DHAP doesn't lie directly on the path of glycolysis. And so what we have to do is we have to take this molecule and we have to transform it into this molecule. Now, just like glucose is an isomer to fructose, DHAP is an isomer to GAP because both of these are trioses and a triose is a three carbon sugar. So we have one, two, three carbons, one, two, three carbons, both of these are trioses. So again, we have to depend on an enzyme called isomerase. What type of isomerase? Well, triose phosphate isomerase. Triose because these are trioses and they contain phosphate groups, one each, and so triose phosphate isomerase basically converts this DHAP, the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, into the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And once stage 2 takes place, we essentially took, so the net result of stage 2 is, we took the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and we cleaved it into two identical 3-carbon molecules, these gap molecules. So, Let's move on to stage three. So essentially, in this stage, I've only listed the reactions for a single GAP molecule, but you should know that all these steps actually take place twice because we have these two molecules that were formed in stage two. So let's move on to stage three. So remember, this is our investment stage. We invest energy to prepare it for the cleavage. Once we cleave it, we basically go on to stage three. And this is where, this is where we're actually going to produce those ATP molecules and pyruvate molecules. So the entire goal here is to basically destabilize the molecule 
and eventually create a molecule that contains a high potential to transfer phosphoryl groups. And we'll see why that's important in just a moment. So let's take a look at step six. So in step six, what we basically want to do is we want to transform the gap molecule into 1,3-BPG. Why? Well, because we want to transform a molecule that has a relatively low potential to transfer phosphoryl to a molecule that has a relatively high potential to transfer that phosphoryl group. And so we basically take the gap, we mix it with our NAD+, and we also use an, orthophos an, an orthophosphate and in the presence of gap dehydrogenase. So dehydrogenase basically means we're going to have a reaction in which there will be a transfer of a hydride group. And so this will be reduced into NADH. We're going to release an H ion and that phosphate, the orthophosphate, will basically attack this molecule and bind onto this carbon here. And so now we have these two phosphate groups on this molecule. So on the first position and the third position. And that's why this molecule is essentially a molecule that has a higher potential to actually transfer that phosphoryl group. And so now in the next step, we can use 1,3-BPG, this same molecule, to basically transfer that phosphoryl group onto an ADP molecule, thereby producing an ATP. And the molecule that catalyzes this, well, again, it must be a kinase. Why? Well, because this is a phosphorylation reaction. And so we use our phosphoglycerate kinase, phosphoglycerate, because this is a 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate. So we mix it with the ADP because this will accept this group here. And so once the process takes place, we essentially form an ATP molecule and we form a 3-phosphoglycerate. Now, what happens with the 3-phosphoglycerate? Well, in the next step, in step 8, we basically want to transform the 3-phosphoglycerate into a, in, into a less stable molecule. So we want to take this and destabilize it, and that will make it more reactive, so that in step 9, it can actually react. So to destabilize this, the goal is, we want to take this phosphate and bring it closer to this negative charge. So we have a negative charge of negative one and a charge of negative two. And if we basically decrease the distance between the negative charge, that will destabilize this molecule. And so we have an enzyme known as phosphoglycerate mutase. A mutase is simply an enzyme that takes a group on the molecule and changes its position. And so we have the phosphoglycerate, so phosphoglycerate mutase will be the enzyme that will take this group and bring it onto the second carbon. And so now we have not three phosphoglycerate, but a two phosphoglycerate. And notice this is an endergonic process, so under physiological conditions, it will not be spontaneous. We have to input energy, and so this molecule will be less stable than this molecule. Now, so now that we have this less stable molecule, we can basically react it in step nine and we can transform it into a molecule that prepares it to form that pyruvate. So we take this molecule and we use enolase to transform it into an enol. So we have phosphoenol pyruvate or PEP. We essentially form a double bond between these and the H and the OH combines and the water is kicked off. And so this is a dehydration reaction. Once we form this molecule, this molecule is not very stable and it has a very high phosphoryl transfer potential. Why? Well, because this is essentially trapped in the enol state and it's trapped because this oxygen doesn't have an H. It has this phosphoryl group. And so what must happen in the final stages, this phosphoryl group must be donated to an ADP molecule and replaced with an H. And once it is replaced with an H, it can transform into the more stable ketone state, the pyruvate molecule. And that's exactly what happens in a final stage. We take this molecule that is 
high in energy, so it contains very active bonds, and that makes it a very good molecule that actually transfers that phosphoryl group onto ADP. And so in the presence of ADP and H+, we take this molecule, and by the action of pyruvate kinase, so again, we form pyruvate in the last step, and this reaction is a phosphorylation reaction, so we're using a kinase, and we form the pyruvate in the ketone state, and that ATP molecule. And because this process takes place twice, we form two ATP molecules here, we form two ATP molecules here, so a total of four ATP molecules in stage five, we use two ATP molecules in stage one, and the net result is we form two ATP molecules in glycolysis per glucose that we actually use up. So if we sum all these individual reactions, and we basically sum up all these individual energy values, keeping in mind that all these take place twice, and so we have to multiply these energy values by two for these five steps, we basically get the following net result. So we have a glucose, we have two ADP, we have two NAD+, we have two PIs, that's our net input, and the net output is